Tedsters. Can you hear me? Mic on? Great. Uh, it really is lovely to see you, and I, I mean that quite literally, because I had a dream last night that none of you turned up. <laughs> uh, and it was kind of awkward, frankly. Uh, I feel it works better this way. Um, I've been really blown away by today's events, really, and, and the, whole, um, the, whole, the whole thing. Uh, the sheer diversity of it and the extraordinary talents of the, of the people who've been speaking today, and many of the people I've met today uh, in between sessions as well. It really has been um, quite remarkable. Um, I think that events like today are incredibly important. What I love about them is that it really, they really celebrate a diversity of thinking and different ideas and different perspectives. And this is, this is tremendously important, and that's what I love about TED as well. It's all about the sharing of ideas and a diversity of human creativity, innovation, and thinking. Now, uh, this runs uh, very deep with me, and it's very consistent with something I'm very, very passionate about, which is education. Um, education is my passion and my, my vocation in life. Um, I've spent most of my life in education in one form or another, either as a, a student or working with leaders in education, and I've been responsible for leading some large change projects in education. And wherever I, I go at the moment, I, I hear a similar theme. It keeps coming, cropping up, and I've been very lucky in my life. I get to travel all around the UK, but also all around the world, talking to education leaders. And I hear a similar theme, though, wherever I go, anywhere in the world. Um, and that's around how the challenge for teachers now, really, is very much about how to prepare young people for a future that is very hard to comprehend. We don't know what it's going to look like. Uh, we all know from our personal lives how rapidly technologies and things are driving change. And that's really one of the, the big challenges, I think, um, for teachers today. And, and I, I hear it wherever I go. So I think we're facing this rapidly changing future. Now, whilst I think that's true, and I think that's a big challenge, I think there's another way of looking at this as well. And, and the way I see it, I'm not at all convinced from my ex experience that we've got education right for the world as it is today, never mind this uncertain future that we, we struggle to comprehend and that we can't quite grasp. And I want to talk a little bit about that today because I think it's profoundly important and I think we need to get it right for the world today. And I think there's a way of doing it, um, but I think um, I've seen some great practice and some great pioneers of this who are getting it right, but it's not consistent enough and not enough people are doing it. So I want to talk a little bit about that today. Now, I've got uh, two kids. I've got a, a daughter who's 14 and a son who's six. Uh, both of them, given their ages, grew up in a, in a digital world. So they're what I think gets referred to as digital natives. Um, for my daughter who's 14, music is digital. Um, she downloads it to a device of one kind or another. She sees no reason to buy a CD. And you can only imagine what she makes of my cassette collection. Uh, she meets in connect an online connected world. If she wants to share information with peers, she has the world of social media and various different technologies at her disposal. So she very much meets in a digital connected world where the sourcing of information and the challenging of it and the challenging of ideas is immediate and any time, any place, on any device in a way that suits them and is personalized to their experience. Incidentally, um, she would have absolutely no comprehension whatsoever of the connection between the images that you see on the screen up there. And frankly, I'm looking around the audience now, and probably a vast majority, if you're below the age of 25, you probably don't either. And I'm not going to explain it to you. You can Google it. Um, <laughs> but uh, if, you're over, if you're my age, um, you'll probably get the connection. Um, so the point I'm making is that the world in which young people are growing up has changed profoundly, and it's changed fast. And my contention is that unless we see the same sort of radical change and transformation in the way that we teach, then there is no future for teachers. However, I am just teasing with you there, because I know there's a lot of teachers in the audience, so don't worry. I think there is a future for teachers, but I think it's something else. And I think we have to acknowledge a few things here. Now, wherever I... Um, go at the moment. And there's another quote I hear. It keeps getting mentioned to me wherever I go and it seems to have caught on with people. And it's something like 80% of the jobs that are advertised today didn't exist 10 years ago. Now, I should point out I've got absolutely no idea whether that's true or not. But it feels true, doesn't it? Isn't that so? Um, and I think that's partly why it's caught on with people, because it feels true. And so if you follow on from that and, you f and, and follow on from that thinking, you know, my argument is 
does that mean that you know, 80% of the function and knowledge of a teacher today will become irrelevant in just that time or less? And I think we've got to really address this as education leaders, and we've, we've got to hit, hit it head on. And I think we've got to recognize something, and that is that learners have changed. This is the world of the digital native now. Now, I know that's a slightly disturbing image. I mean, God, who uses a Blackberry? Um, <laughs> but it's... Um, thank you. <laughs> So I think we've got to acknowledge that learners have changed. Um, this is the world of the digital native now. And I think this is nothing to fear. This is this, I, I, a lot of teachers, in fact, a lot of executives leading education in various places that I talk to privately confess to me that they're slightly scared by this new world and they don't quite know how to attack it. And, and there's a lot of um, fear um, about it. And I think we've got a bit hung up about this, to be perfectly honest, because I don't think it is anything to fear. And I think part of the reason we're hung up about it is really nostalgia. Nostalgia for our own education uh, and our own way of doing things. And I think we need to really sort of let it go. And by the way, I love that old quote about nostalgia isn't what it used to be. Um, I, I think we need to let it go and move on from that. And it's nothing to fear. Young people are immersed in technology and it's changing fast. I mean, my son who's six, I mean, he expects to physically interact with technology. So he's grown up with tablets and various devices and he opens up apps and things. But he also interacts with games technologies that sense his movement. And pretty soon, I'm sure he's going to be wearing technology, as are most of us probably within a few years or less. So I can imagine us having conversations about, do you remember those old tablets and those old apps? Well, aren't they quaint? That's going to happen quite quickly, I think. And uh, th this has got profound implications for educational leaders. Uh, you know, social uh, media technology is part of everyday life. And uh, this has got uh, really important implications as well because it's transforming the way that people connect, thrive, share ideas. Um, the really interesting implication for me is that self-learning is now becoming the norm. So yeah, this whole flipped classroom concept that gets thrown around in education, which basically just means that most of the learning is taking place outside of the conventional environment through these various technologies, and then they, they bring their knowledge and experience into the classroom at a later point. Um, I think that's, that's really the norm now. It's almost like a digital by default model, and some of the concepts we've heard about earlier today, it's been, it's been fascinating to me because it really resonates with what I see happening. So I think we have to recognize that. And I think we have to recognize something else as well is that the world of the digital native, there's a lot of increasing evidence to suggest that the way people think is actually changing. And I see this firsthand every day. I mean, I work in a fantastic college at the moment with a, with a brilliant leadership team. And when I spend time around the young people that are in that, that space, uh, I can tell the way that they're thinking is, is different. There's a preference for video over text. That's got massive implications for anyone involved in designing a website for young people. If, if educators think that a, uh, a college or university website should have loads and loads of text on it that's been pulled from some module descriptor somewhere, it's probably not a good idea. Uh, there's a preference for video. There's also a natural ability, in fact, a better natural ability for multitasking than I think at any point in all of human history. And I think this has partly been driven by the way that technologies are now synergized into daily rituals and the way that we live. Um, but there's a range of other uh, interesting implications as well, because I think attention spans are getting shorter, which is interesting if you're a teacher. And I think the ability to focus on one task is also changing, which, once again, I think is very interesting if you're a teacher. However, the key point for me is that the way that people think is changing, and it looks less like a line and more like spaghetti. And so it follows for me that if you put young people into a linear structured process, like I certainly experienced when I was at school, which uh, education did, really didn't switch me on at all originally, then it's not going to resonate with them because it won't resonate with who they are. And it won't resonate with their characteristics and what they're passionate about. And I think as educators, we've got a responsibility to tap into that and do something about it. So I think if you don't put uh, people into a situation that inspires them and engages with them, and then it's, it's going to cause disengagement. And I think that's what's wrong with a whole uh, large aspect of the education system as it is today. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't resonate with people, and it isn't consistent enough for who they are and what it's about. And I think this is a scary journey into the unknown for a lot of teachers and a lot of, a lot of educators. But I think we have to embrace this change, or we become irrelevant, frankly because there's an explosion of free quality online provision across the world. People are achieving their dreams in their own way through peers and networks and social learning and contacts they're making outside of the formal education process. I just want to share with you a story about this guy, because this guy's quite remarkable in my opinion. Uh, and he's, he's, although he's a bit of an extreme example that hit the press, and you may have seen him in the press just recently, I think he's indicative of a lot of young people that I'm encountering these days. 
Um, this guy's name is Nick, and he's from London. And he hit the press recently because he developed an app. The app was called Sumly. Now, I should point out, I have no idea really what this thing does, but I think it was something about content management. And it seemed to do something quite clever. So clever, in fact, he caught the attention of one of the world's technology giants, which in this case was Yahoo. And the key point for me is that he developed this when he was 15 years old. And he developed it whilst fitting it around his, uh, his examinations, his GCSEs at the time in maths, and, uh, and his wider social commitments as a busy, connected 15-year-old. And now, he's a multimillionaire, a technology pioneer, an inventor, and before the age of 18, he's landed a job at one of the world's technology giants on the board. It's the kind of story that makes me reflect on my own life, and I don't know what the hell I've been doing with my time, frankly. <laughs> I, I, He's, he's really remarkable. Now, okay, he's a, he's a press-worthy kind of... He's great for a story, you know. He might seem like an extreme example, only he isn't. Whilst they might not hit the press, I know many young people, teenagers, who are developing apps and using technology as well. Now, they might not be becoming millionaires, and they might not be landing jobs at Yahoo, but they might be making the same salary as a teacher, and they're 15. Now, I find this fascinating. It's got profound implications, I think, for where we're going in education, because self-learning really is becoming the norm. And I think we've got to think about how we reinvent... Um, the role of teachers to become relevant in the 21st century. And the key point about him as well is that he taught himself to code at the age of 12. Taught himself, I think, is the interesting point there. So my second contention, really, is that if young people are achieving their aspirations and their dreams in this way outside of the formal education setting, I think we've got to recognise something else as well. The formal um, concept of the classroom has also changed. Um, because people are using all these uh, social media and various other technologies to connect, uh, no matter where they are, um, wherever they happen to be in the world. So it really doesn't matter where you are anymore. Um, I know this from my own personal experience, because I, I was responsible for leading the largest rollout of cloud technology in, in the education sector in the whole of Europe, um, just down the road from here, actually. And it really did lead to a profound cultural change in the way that people were able to receive education and connect and share ideas and really thrive in a way that made sense to them, because they could access it in a way that uh, suited them on any device at a time that suited them as well. And it's not all about... Um, some sort of virtual classroom or anything like that. It's about providing education in a way that makes sense to people in the world that we live today, which may be in a digital setting or it may not. So I think the classroom has uh, fundamentally changed. And I think we need to think about how we create learning spaces as educators um, to provide a space that is, is really consistent with who people are and inspires their, their passions. This clip that's on the screen um, at the moment is from a childhood I didn't have. Um, but it feels like I had it. Um, now, it's a, it's a classroom, obviously, from the, the past. Uh, my education when I was at school was in colour, because we had colour in the 1970s. Um, it had just gone to colour. Uh, but I sort of, when I think of it, it's, it's like that. It was in linear rows of desks, and uh, basically there was a teacher at the front who imparted knowledge in a linear direction. And I was supposed to regurgitate that and pass some sort of test at some point further on. Now, in too many places, my argument is that education is still happening like that. I, I visit all manner of education providers all across the world and, and all throughout this country. And don't get me wrong, there are some examples of stunning practice and very progressive practice. But too often it hasn't changed fundamentally. Too often the dusty chalkboard thing that we used to have has been replaced with an e-board that's still in the same place and the desks are still kind of in the same way. Um, I think that's uh, wrong and I think we need to change it. And I've got some experience of having done this, because I did create a classroom of the future on our doorstep, actually, in Birmingham at a, at a very large local uh, or, or college just down the road. And it, 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 was, it was a really quite a transformational learning space that enabled people to find their passion. It resonated with people and who they, they are, because it enabled them to learn in a tailored way that made sense to them. Um, so I do think the learning spaces that we create are fundamentally important, and I think we have to change the place of learning, just as where learning takes place has also changed in our world. Now then, I see a number of educators, by the way, trying to uh, tap into this a little bit, um, but they're, they're not always getting it right. Um, yeah, I love that. Um, <laughs> it's an American thing I grabbed, by the way, as well, which is why meters, I think, is spelt wrong. Um, anyway. It makes the point that in today's world, uh, this is, brings me on really to what I think the reinvention of teaching and learning needs to become. Because for teaching and learning to remain relevant in the 21st century, I think there's a key role to play in what I think gets called digital literacy, wherever I go. But basically, it's about finding reliable quality information in an online world. And I, I, you know, I know this from my own personal experience, because whenever I'm ill, I Google it, and, I, and every time it's fatal. 
And so, you know, there's a role to play about helping young people for a particular subject specialism, whatever it might be for a particular teacher, to bring it to life, inspire and engage people, and help them find reliable quality information and to use exercise um, good judgment and to use their good judgment in an online world. And that, I think, is where a lot of the future for teachers is going. Because most of the time, young people, especially you know, from my experience, uh, when they're searching online, they're getting it wrong. They're, they're not finding the right kind of information. So I think digital literacy is a big issue. My uh, third and final point, really, is just that as the uh, learners have changed and the classroom has changed, uh, so the world has changed also. And I think as teachers and, and as, as leaders in education, we need to address this and really recognize the possibilities here. And there's some really exciting possibilities of using some of these technologies in really creative ways to really um, transform the teaching and learning experience. Um, however, I think it's true to say that a lot of education leaders and also national education policy has not exactly warmed to these developments. Too often I hear teachers complain about having to comply with certain policies, and unfortunately we do run national education systems, it seems, um, especially here in the UK, uh, too much about compliance, and therefore teachers are not often empowered to take risks and be prepared to be wrong because too often it's about compliance. I think we have to change that. I think we have to be brave enough to be wrong and be prepared to be wrong, and I think we have to take some risks. And I think in doing so, we will provide a much more immersive and rich and memorable learning uh, experience that inspires young people to really unlock their potential. And I think that's fundamentally important. And I, I don't think we can ignore this anyway, quite frankly, because uh, it was Tolkien who once said that you can fence yourself in, but you can't fence the world out. And I think a lot of educators need to recognize that and really change their, their models of how they operate. Learning needs to become more interconnected and cross-disciplinary. And I think that's a theme that we've heard in a, in a few of the presenters today, actually. Uh, I was making some notes earlier, and I think that, that's something we really need to be aware of. So, I would also like to say that I think that from an employer's point of view as well, I think the employers are going to care more about how young people add business value through creativity and creative thinking and different thinking and connectivity and innovation and less about specific information that could be sourced within seconds. Because isn't that true? I mean, the teacher's no longer the guru of knowledge because how can that be the case when you can Google it, so to speak? So, I just want to end really by saying that... Um, I think we also need a new language in education. Uh, this is another one of my personal bugbears. Wherever I go in education, I still hear people talk about e-learning. And I think it's well-intentioned. I think it's in, it comes from a lot of things that are well-intentioned, but perhaps have other uh, interpretations. Uh, but for me, it really kind of reveals some of the actual problem, which is it reveals kind of yesterday's thinking. Because can you show me a job in today's world where technology doesn't have some impact or another on whatever it might be? It's not e-learning now. It's just learning. And I think we need to let that go. So, for me, the reason I'm passionate about education is because it transforms life chances and it unlocks potential. And that's fundamentally its purpose, and I believe that everybody has potential. Um, but too often, the education system doesn't resonate with people, and you end up with something like this, where people are disengaged. How many brilliant, fantastic people have you met in your life who say, oh, I left school at 15, but I did this fantastic stuff afterwards, you know? And so we're failing people. And we can't afford to go on that way. It's too important. Um, I believe this passionately. I believe that teaching needs to become more about coaching that is tailored to people's personal learning styles and really inspires people to become the best that they can be. The prize, if we get this right, is the acceleration of new knowledge discovery and creative innovation and an education system that becomes what it was always supposed to be. This matters more than anything to me because I think it offers us the biggest hope for the future. I think we have to be bold and be prepared to take a risk and to pioneer some risk, a bit like the guy on his skateboard on the screen there. Um, I love that slide. Uh, it reminds me of me for some strange reason I can't work out. Um, so I think it offers us our best hope, uh, not just for our region here in Birmingham and, and the wider UK, but I think it offers us the best hope for our wider global collective future and prosperity. Thank you. <laughs>